My name is uh, Amjad Masad. Um, I work at Facebook and I'm here to talk to you about uh, JavaScript debugging. Uh, so actually when um, I first uh, started working at Facebook about uh, seven or eight months ago, um, what, one of the main things that I focused on is just quality. So I worked on the photos team and uh, one of the things that we needed to optimize and make better was the uh, album upload quality. And, um, and so we, we didn't build new products. I didn't like ship a ton of code. I just spent a lot of my time just debugging JavaScript. And we came up with this number that is about upload reliability, just to tell us uh, uh, how well we're doing. It's all like our main metric that we wanted to hit. Um, and you know, when people uh, hear reliability, a lot of the times they, they, they think about like the four nines of reliability and think about like servers and things like that. But uh, one thing that is a lot of time is missing is actually reliability from the client side. Um, and because of that, I spend a lot of my time just debugging JavaScript. Uh, and debugging JavaScript at Facebook is not like debugging JavaScript at any other smaller product because you have a lot of JavaScript uh, on the page. You have thousands and thousands of JavaScript modules and they load lazily and they, uh, so it just like ever increasing JavaScript. Uh, so I ended up uh, learning a lot of techniques uh, that are, uh, as I'd like to say, lesser known techniques in, uh, in debugging JavaScript. And um, this is what I'm, I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so actually, uh, we got 1% increase in upload reliability on Facebook.com uh, by fixing a few JavaScript bugs. Uh, so you don't usually hear that when people talk about reliability, they talk about like how they like created distributed servers or whatever they're talking about, but we actually got 1% increase from, um, from purely JavaScript debugging. Uh, when I sat down to prepare for this talk uh, a few months ago, I thought it'd be interesting to start with a question. So how far have we come? How far have we come in terms of JavaScript development? How far have we come in terms of the tools that we have today? And that took me back to 2001. In 2001, I was in high school, but I also did uh, Visual Basic uh, programming. Um, I really enjoyed one part of Visual Basic a lot, which is the interactive nature of, uh, of of programming. I know a lot of you may thinking like Visual Basic, what the hell are you talking about? But, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, as someone who was self-taught, uh, what I uh, used to do is write as little code as possible just to be able to see something on the screen and then instantly jump into the debugger and try to uh, sort of beat it into shape. Um, so one of the tools that really helped me do that was called Immediate. Um, they call it Immediate, I have no reason, I, I don't think they have any reason why not to call it a console, but they call it Immediate. It's basically a console or a REPL uh, what you can do is you can query the live environment so you can look at your variables just to see like what uh, What the values of your variables are, but what you can also do is call methods and I think you can also restart the current uh, call stack and a lot of the times what I end up doing is write some code then jump into debugging and then start ch changing variables start calling methods just to figure out what's wrong and how I can fix it um, so I really liked VB uh, programming, but uh, when the web started becoming ubiquitous, uh, at least uh, where I'm from, I'm from Jordan. It took us a while until we uh, until the web really became a thing. I think in 2001, everyone had a browser. Uh, I think my friends had browsers. Even my grandmother had a browser. And uh, like any young nerd, I would, uh, or even like anyone just hacking on stuff. Every time I see a computer that is available at, uh, in, in people's hands, I want to just you know create stuff and be able to ship it to them, right? So I learned a little bit of JavaScript. So what I learned is how to open a script tag and how to do document.write because that was the way to, to do JavaScript then. Um, and, and I did that. I, write, I wrote document.write hello world. But then I, I opened that in the browser, and what I got was basically just an empty screen. Uh, and, and I was like, oh, I must have done something incredibly horrible that it's treating me that way. I went back to the code, I, I, it looked fine, and then went back here until I finally noticed 
this small triangle right here. <laughs> and if you really, really squint your eyes and try to look at it, it looks like it's trying to tell you that there's an error or something happened on the page. So I clicked that triangle. And actually, it t you know, sure enough, it was trying to tell me that there was an error on the page. Well, at least it's, it's giving me the line number two, but it's also a very cryptic error, object expected. Of course you were expecting objects. What do you want from me? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so all this to say that we've really come a long way since, uh, since that small little silly triangle to the state of the arts DevTools that we have today. Um, but this talk is not gonna be about DevTools. This talk is just gonna be about techniques that I've learned from JavaScript uh, uh, debugging. So I've already talked about this part. Uh, uh, I, I do a bunch of other projects and sometimes write, so you can find me on my website, amasad.me, or Twitter, amasad. So, uh, the talk is going to be three parts, uh, code that's easier to debug, debugging tips and tricks, and the tools. So writing code that's easier to debug. I think the, the first thing, uh, when, when I, uh, so, so, you know, after 2001, after like seeing what happened to JavaScript, I really swore it off and went back to VB and then just came back to actually web development in 2009. Um, and one thing that I found really fun about web development and JavaScript in particular was functions. Like functions were really a primary thing and, uh, you know, having uh, higher level functions and the ability to, to do callbacks and, and do sort of functional programming was really a fun thing when you're programming JavaScript. Uh, but the more and more I, I write production code, uh, it, it becomes more obvious that just writing everything in lambdas uh, is a really huge pain in the ass when you, when you really want to debug it. Um, so to illustrate that, I'm going to give a few contrived examples. So this is a, sort of a warning for uh, the faint-hearted out there. Um, so one thing that uh, a lot of times is emphasized in programming languages is whether uh, the state is hidden well or not. Uh, I think that's definitely a good attribute of especially a, a secure programming model. But uh, a lot of the times when you're debugging, you really need to have your state exposed in order to watch it, in order to change it, in order to do different stuff on it while you're debugging. So uh, for example, if uh, you want to write a sort of a con counter uh, module, uh, the way to do it in, in functions is you would have a factory function called counter, you'd pass it a value, and then it will return a function. One called will increment the value, and then it will return the value, right? That's a one simple way to do it. Um, if, if you do it using classes, uh, it's basically a class called counter. Uh, you instantiate it using new, and you pass it a value. It will have a state, which is th this dot value. Uh, and then whenever you can call an, an, an increment method on it and that will increment and, and return it. So functionality wise, they're, they're equivalent. Uh, but the difference is when you're debugging from the outside, say you have that counter object. If you have the first type of object, you can't really know what's happening inside it, right? If you have the second type of object, you can actually just do counter.value from your console and you can see what's happening. You can also change that, uh, that value while you're debugging. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I think it's valuable to sort of change things from the console. So another problem with, uh, with just using uh, functions as the basic unit of abstraction is that you can't really monkey patch closures. And I, I think it's definitely important um, in production not to do these sort of stuff, to like monkey patch and change things at runtime. But I think while you're debugging, I think it's it's definitely important to be able to to change your your classes and your methods uh, to to do interesting stuff with debugging. So sometimes uh, sometimes I actually change a method while debugging just to see what happens, just to see just to try out a new idea without going back to code and iterate really fast on it. So here I'm changing increments to actually decrement. It's probably. That's why I'm saying it's contrived examples. <laughs> it's extremely contrived. Um, so here's the like the extreme example of like using functions. So uh, this is actually a way to implement counter using pure functions. 
uh, let's say you, you still have a, a factory function um, called counter, you pass it a value, it returns a function that when called will expose that original value. Um, and then you have an increment function that is passed the original function returned from, from the previous function and will return a function once called will increment that value. Um, we'll call the original function to, to expose the value and then increment it. Um, so it's kind of cool to be able to do these sort of things and like that's why we love JavaScript. But actually in production, if I, I, I wanted to debug this, if I wanted to point to the point where my value changes and say, hey, set a breakpoint when this value changes, I can never do that. Because guess what? The value never changes. So another tip is uh, making classes and objects uh, accessible from the console. Um, I think this is, this is really important. A lot of times we're using RequireJS, we're using AMD, we're using all these really nice tools. Uh, and they, they hide all these modules uh, from you. In production, that's sort of a good thing. Uh, actually, I would argue even in production, you need to expose uh, your top level modules uh, and definitely you need to do it in development to be able to do things from the console. I'll give you a few examples how uh, this is valuable. Um, so like I said, like looking at an at a object state or an application state in debugging is extremely valuable. So uh, let's say you, um, uh, you refresh the page and it ran some code and then you want to check whether the application in the state you'd expect it to be, right? You're trying, let's say you're trying to debug some, some bug that's happening. Uh, it's incredibly easy to just do app.counter.value, just to get the value from the counter. Um, now, if, it, if this is hidden behind uh, Clojure, you, can, uh, you can't really uh, do that unless you're inside a breakpoint. Uh, a lot of the times between different runs of the code, like between uh, clicking something, uh, it reveals a lot of the times what's wrong with your application by just merely looking at your application state. Another important thing is to be able to start things from the console. So let's say you have a user model and that user model updates every time it changed from the server. Say another user on a different machine change it, you send an event from the server and then that re-renders, right? Uh, now, every time you want to debug that, you should, uh, you basically have to log in using a different machine, log in uh, using a different user, and uh, try to invoke a change event so that the other client will actually re-render. Uh, but that's a lot of work. Why not just have your user model accessible from the console so you can emit changes? So we're uh, basically just like emitting and change on the user model, and then the view would react to that and, and uh, render its view so you can, uh, you can test your code. So another uh, really important uh, part is the ability to sec uh, set uh, breakpoints from the console. So uh, the way we usually do breakpoints is you go to the source code of the, of, the, of the function or the method that you want to break on and you set a breakpoint. But uh, that's limiting because first of all, you need to know where the source code is, you need to navigate to it. Uh, but also we don't have the source code for native methods. Um, so it's going to be incredibly valuable to be able to debug uh, methods just from the console. So this is uh, a command line API function that I'll talk and explain more about later. It's just called debug. Um, and yeah, I'll just explain later. <laughs> All right, so uh, the second part of the talk is uh, debugging tips and tricks. So uh, I'll try to like, leave you guys with a few solid tips that you can actually take home and, and use it tomorrow or today if you like working late. Um, so, uh, so one thing that I found really valuable is to always have my program in a runnable state. Um, and what I mean by runnable state is the ability to actually refresh the browser and get something on the screen. I find it incredibly motivating when I, when I, when I always have my program like that. Uh, I do a lot of side projects. I like to hack on a lot of things on the side. Uh, one of the biggest killers of my side projects, just having it in a broken state. If, uh, if I know that every time I need to go back to my side projects and spend like 30 minutes just trying to get it to run, just trying to get to a state where it's actually running, I'm, I'm just gonna abandon that project. So 
Uh, and that is also uh, true for development branches. Uh, try to get your code always to be in a runnable state. Um, try to split up your big changes into smaller steps. I think one of the like eye-opening parts of uh, my career so far was learning, like really learning version control and what it can do to you as, as a developer and the ability to uh, to sort of take small bets and uh, iterate quickly on code um, it just profoundly helps. Uh, I'd like to think about this as breadth first versus depth first. Um, you know, as engineers, we like these kind of analogies. Um, I think uh, with depth first is you basically, so at any given point you want to solve a problem, you have always uh, a lot of paths that you can go down uh, to. So. Um, with a depth first approach, with an approach where you're like really stubborn and want to get that feature out and you, you're hacking on uh, in a way that you think it's going to solve that problem, uh, you sort of like keep going down that path and eventually you may hit a wall where something you didn't expect happen or an API did not exist and then you have to backtrack all the way and you've lost a lot of time. Whereas um, if you're, if you're approaching your code by doing just small changes at a time, you can easily just explore new ways of doing things without actually uh, you know, getting to a place where you're too invested in it to sort of like backtrack and get to, to the original state. So I know it's a little bit too abstract, but I'll clarify in a little bit. So, and, and to, as, a, as a follow up to that point, uh, the ability to just change and break things uh, is, is incredibly valuable. So if, if, if you know that just two, two steps back, if you know that you, there's two commands on your console uh, that can basically get your code to a runnable, uh, runnable version, it's really easy to take bold steps. It's really easy to try to do something uh, that, have, uh, like a, that have a minimal chance of success. Um, and that also translates while in, in debugging mode. If you're in debugging mode, uh, the ability to just change methods on the fly, the ability to do live editing, to change your value, to change your state, just to try a different path in your code, I think is uh, incredibly important. And one final note on that is lean on your tools. Just uh, you know, learn version control, uh, learn it really well. Um, and uh, with debuggers and things like that, just uh, I think it's very important to uh, to be able to t take these bold steps. And the only way to do it with confidence is to be able to lean on your tools. So w one tip that I have for you is uh, what I like to call setting up traps. So a lot of times when you have a large team that is working on, on the same application, a lot of times when, uh, you know, in websites, that's what we do. We all commit to the same uh, source control. We're all, all of our code are eventually will run on the same thread. So it's, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly frightening that everyone will, you know, you have thousands of engineers at the company and everyone's code will eventually commingle. Um, and a lot of the times you can't step debug all the code when you're, when you're trying to debug a certain problem. And let me skip to, towards an example uh, because this is getting too abstract. So uh, the other day I was trying to debug a problem on facebook.com where uh, you're scrolling in feed and suddenly uh, you're back to the top just for no reason. And uh, it, was, it was really hard to debug, but um, the first thing that anyone would try is to go to the code base and grip for the ways that you can change the scroll position. So how would you change the scroll position? You can either call scroll to, you can call, call scroll by, or you can change the scroll top of the body or the document elements, right? So gripping for this in Facebook's uh, uh, web code base brings up 3,000 results. <laughs> so it's gonna take me about a year to go through all of them and try to figure out whether this is changing my code. Um, so the only way, I, at least for me, maybe, maybe you're smarter than me and you can figure out a, a better way, uh, you probably are, but uh, for now, let's say, setting up runtime traps is the easiest way to attack this problem. So what do I mean by runtime run traps? Um, so here's, a, here's an example. So um, with, with uh, native methods, unlike um, your source, unlike your own methods, 
uh, we don't have a source for that, right? So we can't set a breakpoint on that. Um, so what we can do is we can actually replace the native method. We can replace it with another function. That's why JavaScript is cool. That's why it's, it's malleable. It allows for this sort of thing. So we can basically, for example, um, let's take an example. Let's say you have um, a link on the page that is not working. You're clicking that link and that's not taking you to, to the URL of that link. Uh, what could you what what you think is happening is prevent default uh, is being called somehow right so what you can do is you can re replace the prevent default function and uh, insert a debugger statement so next time prevent default is called you can uh, it, it will break and you simply just go up one step in the stack and you'll see the offending code and same thing with um, scroll top and scroll by and all that stuff what I did when I attacked this bug is basically I replaced all these functions, but with a debugger statement. And eventually when that thing called them, I just went one step in the call stack and I found that a function that was, uh, was trying to scroll the page. <laughs> uh, so actually a fun story about this uh, particular example. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I remember seeing a tweet by Dominic and uh, I think he was, I think you were saying like, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I, I did exactly this and I was able to caught, uh, catch the, the function. And, uh, and the fun thing about it is this actually inspired me to, uh, to write a, a blog post and to release the tools that I've been working on. And eventually the, the popularity of that stuff uh, led me to sort of apply to conferences with this talk. Uh, so if you have any complaints, if you think this stock sucks, just direct them to Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> any thank yous, of course. Um, so another, uh, another uh, trap that you can set is breaking on custom events. So uh, when an event, a lot of the time, like really something annoying about JavaScript development is uh, if events, it, although like events and callbacks and asynchronous stuff, although sometimes it could be fun, but it also is an annoying thing to debug. Uh, so one thing that I, that I found really valuable is to make when I want to make sure an event is probably as properly uh, being emitted is to um, to listen at the event with a function that simply has a debugger statement. And next time that event um, is triggered, I can the you know the debugger would break, and I can look in and make sure all the parameters that I want are being passed and be able to properly debug it. So uh, that's one way that I find valuable. Also, I think you'd, uh, you'd enjoy this uh, command line API called uh, monitor events. Uh, when you call it on an element, every time an event is triggered, uh, is emitted on the element, on the like a DOM node, uh, it will actually show it in the, in the console. So uh, another one is breaking in property access. So a lot of times you have changes uh, that goes, um, uh, you know, you're, you're step debugging and suddenly you find that one of your variables or one of your states uh, or one property on your object suddenly is changing from under your feet and you don't know what, what changed it. Uh, unlike methods, we can't really replace it with a function to be able to uh, to debug it, but what you can do is uh, add uh, setters and getters. And inside that setters and getters, uh, so are you guys familiar with the setters and getters? You are? All right, cool. Uh, and I inside the setter, you'll just have a debugger statement. And next time something tries to set that, uh, that uh, property on your, on your object, um, you'll get a breakpoint and you you'll be able to find out uh, what's trying to change your, your variables. Another fun thing, I think in the, in the blog post that I wrote, I linked to your your blog about this. Oh, really? You blogged about oh, this, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is the one that I've done all the time. Yeah. So I'm just getting ideas from everyone and just, <laughs> you know, taking them. Um, so uh, another thing which is very similar to uh, to the to the events part is just on callbacks. Just you know, adding that debugger statement on callbacks, uh, and finally. Um, actually not finally, just one more thing, as break on uh, DOM mutations. So this actually can be done from DevTools. You can actually right click and, and, um, 
and break on attribute modification or, or subtree modification. And this works uh, pretty well. But um, I think if, if you do it manually, so if you listen to DOM mutation events yourself, you're going to have more fine-grained control over what, what uh, changes that you want to do. Um, and also, uh, a cool thing that landed recently in, in Chrome DevTools was async call stack. So before, if you, if you tried to do this, you just get a very small call stack because the DOM mutation event uh, uh, was the cause of, the, uh, of your function to be executed. But with the async call stacks, you'll actually see what caused that original uh, change to happen, and then you'll get a full call stack. Um, so another one that is uh, sort of speculative, so object mutation events um, uh, recently landed using object.observe. Uh, and I'm thinking maybe in the future we can be able to debug on properties like add, change, delete. But right now with this, uh, with object.observe, there isn't uh, async call stack. I don't know why, but uh, I'm thinking this is a bug or not working yet. They did just release Chrome 36 today. It might be in there. Okay. okay. Check that. Um, so the final part, which is uh, tools. This is the part where I tell you about uh, all the fancy tools that you can use. Um, so the first one, uh, command line API. So learn it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I think it's going to need like five talks to be able to talk about DevTools and all the features that, that DevTools has. And I think you guys got to talk um, like at, at this uh, meetup like a, uh, about DevTools at some point. Um, so, but these are my favorites, dollar sign zero. Uh, whatever you have selected in the elements pane, is, this is actually a reference to it. Uh, dollar sign is query selector all, just uh, alias to dollar sign. Uh, monitor events I explained before, and then get event listeners will get you all the event listeners on a given element. I think dollar sign one zero three yeah. five. Yeah. Um, this is a wrong slide because it's not undocumented anymore. Uh, so I blogged about it, I boasted about it, you know, finding undocumented APIs, um, and uh, they finally fixed it. Um, and I, I remember like tweeting at Poil Irish uh, and saying, um, hey, I guess I'll have to st stop saying it's undocumented APIs. And he's like, I'm just, I'm just trying to show off here to say that I was the reason they documented the APIs. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but those APIs are really, really like profoundly awesome. I don't know why people did not use them before. Um, Finding the spelling would have been really hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that? Montior. That was the spelling of Monitor is Montior. Oh, yeah. That's why. That's why people did not. <laughs> <laughs> I would try, bro. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so debug, giving any, any uh, uh, reference to a function. You just call debug on it, and it will actually set a breakpoint on the first line in that function. It's awesome. Just uh, try it next time you're in, uh, in DevTools. Monitor will do the same. It will just log the parameters passed to that function. So debug utils is um, a tool that I tried to capture everything that I told you about now and a lot more. Uh, that has all these tools to allow you to set breakpoints and setters, getters, events. Um, uh, what else? Uh, let's see. Uh, getters, setters, events, uh, methods, um, and a lot of other things. Just go to github.com, amosad, debug utils. And and yeah, yeah I, I really I really recommend it. It's. It's awesome. I know I'm biased, but I think it's still awesome. Uh, but uh, so another thing uh, that I've mentioned earlier in this talk is is live editing, and uh, I think live editing is an awesome feature uh, that really um, uh, really plays well with what I'm talking about here. Is trying to uh, change your environment, trying to change your code as much as possible to learn while in the live environment to be able to iterate fast on your code, and then taking all everything that you've learned and putting it back into code. Uh, so live editing is, is a way to actually change live code. So a lot of people uh, say hot swapping, or there's a lot of uh, different names, live coding, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so by, by 
but what really why do I really want live editing you know I can I can talk about how you know we're artists and we should not be separated from from the art that we're creating and all that bullshit but it's really crap what I what I really want why I really want live editing for is because I'm lazy because I'm impatient because I'm a sloppy coder you know I, I do a lot of typos I want to be able to fix them on the fly without like doing another refresh cycle I want to be able to see my code as soon as possible uh, w without losing motivation and going on Twitter or reddit or whatever and because I'm really lazy I don't want to like keep alt tabbing between things um, so so here's a here's a video uh, that illustrates why life uh, coding is good. So of course this is dodge script. This is what we use at, at Facebook uh, and, and I'm trying to set a console log on a function that uploads a photo. This is part of the work that I've done on. So I go and refresh facebook.com and I try to go to the user flow where I'm working on which is the and then I see this gif and I, I get distracted for an hour in my timeline and clicked on it and just like look at this guy that's taking so many so much ecstasy but um, <laughs> But then I finally get to my get to my actual thing just to go back and see that there's a there's a typo or or an error. Uh, so this is just to illustrate how hard it is to uh, to just iterate and code really fast. It's not only the the time it takes to refresh, but also it's the time to to get to the user flow. But it's also the risk that you're gonna get distracted by something else along the way or maybe maybe it's only me but I get distracted often <laughs> especially like refreshing facebook.com and getting all that to timeline <laughs> so uh, so I, I built this tool uh, just to to help me iterate faster and and be able to write code without having to go back and forth and refreshing the the page so I call it uh, flow but for trademark reasons uh, I call it FB flow uh, and uh, it's an open source tool by Facebook. It allows you live edit JavaScript, CSS, and actually like any static resource. Um, it supports build steps and any development environment. It's also easy to integrate and hackable. So, um, I, I, the most basic uh, explanation for it, it's it basically it's a tool that allows you to write code in your editor and immediately see it in the browser window without having to refresh. Even JavaScript. I know a lot of people use live reload and live edit and a lot of those stuff, but this is also not just for CSS, but also JavaScript. So uh, I'm gonna be I'm gonna feel like uh, ingenuine if I uh, or disgenuous. I don't know what the word, but I, I'm not gonna feel good about myself if I didn't mention all the tools. The other tools like live reload, lifestyle are really good for CSS, but they don't do JavaScript. Um, Another tool that does JavaScript is Chrome Workspaces, which is what Flow is built on top of, uh, the dev tools. But Chrome Workspaces, uh, the pro there are a few problems that I try to solve with it. Um, it doesn't support a build step. So if you actually, if you're using ES6 or Dutch script, um, you, uh, every time uh, it, it, Chrome Workspaces stops working if, you're, if you have source maps. It, uh, live edit st stops working. And there's no support for remote file systems. You can only map um, static resources to your local file system, but not remote file system. And you can't choose your, your favorite editor. You have to use uh, Chrome DevTools editor. So how is uh, Flow built? Uh, Flow is two components, a server-side component and a client component. The server-side component is, a, is an NPM module that you basically require and then you write a simple function uh, I call resolver, which basically just uh, tra um, it's, it's a mapping between uh, the static resource and uh, your local file system. And it also gives you a file watching uh, capability. So you can watch the files. When they change, uh, your function will be called. It, will, uh, it should return the contents uh, that you want to be sent to the client. It will be sent to the client. Uh, the client is a Chrome extension. Um, that will basically hot swap the code and will um, will get the new code in so you see it uh, automatically without refreshing the browser. Um, there are a few drawbacks to it. Like for example, uh, if you already have state on the page, uh, that will changing the code will not change the state because the state already existed. So a lot of times you need to write custom co code in order to update your state every time uh, the code changes. Thank you. Any questions? So for flow, you have uh, pre 
processor support. Yeah. Right. Um, so actually, like anything support. So anything support. so yeah. So <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's a file watcher, and every time the file changes, it will call a function of your choosing, and basically pass you a callback. It's like do whatever you want. This is the file that changed. Uh, just give me the back the contents and the static resource name, and I'll update the client with it. Yeah. How is that for your battery life? Flow? Like watch? Constantly watch. So, so uh, the state of watching files in Node is pretty broken. Uh, and there are a lot of tools. And I think a lot of people uh, talk about the battery life because of uh, tools like Gaze uh, and tools that do polling. I think uh, Chokidar just uses also includes... Um, uh, includes a native extension. A lot of those are really resource in, uh, intensive, but I've written uh, another one, just use it for flow, called Sane. And and this actually, it's an interesting story um, from the Ember team, uh, on why they switched to, uh, to Sane. One, one of them were was on a flight and uh, he was running out of battery. I think they were using Gaze and it was like eating up battery life. And he switched to Sane just to save up battery uh, in order to, to continue his, his flight and, and write his code. So, yeah. So check it out, Sane, NPM package. I'm, I'm really amazed that you managed to produce the one working file system watcher in the entire NPM system. I've been using Gaze and I've not seen these problems, maybe because I tweak my UV it. I, where are these issues coming from? Uh, I don't know. I, I've seen it definitely when I was using it, just like CPU, just like uh, the CPU, just uh, it, it hogs up the CPU for some reason. Okay. Um, I feel so not cool for never having the problem of being battery life bound. Yeah. Like while you're programming something in an airplane, thinking, yeah. oh man, if I only had this better watch. <laughs> this is the only use case, by the way. <laughs> Thank you.